Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Rhetoric Book 2, Aristotle analyzes at considerable length anger and its opposite, calmness or mildness. And in the course of discussing mildness, which is the opposite of anger, he looks at a number of important dynamics. And one of those that's particularly interesting and applicable, although perhaps Aristotle is generalizing a little bit too much with this, has to do with being angry at one person, but discharging your anger at another person, or at least another target, and then becoming calm with respect to the first person, becoming no longer angry with them, no longer feeling it, no longer directing your anger at them. And he talks about this at first in, in a very general way. He says that vengeance or whatever we want to translate it as, uh, retribution, revenge, timoria, right? And this is interesting because usually he uses timoresis is what we're aiming for, but this is the closely connected term, re a restoration of honor, respect, social status, uh, self-esteem, however we want to put it, setting things right. So vengeance that is quite literally in the Greek, taken, it's coming from the word, uh, the verb, lambane, uh, to, to grab, to seize, to take, right? Vengeance that's taken against another person, par alu, right? Uh, literally against uh, the other, calms, he says, praue, anger that you feel against a person, heteron, another person. And then he says something really remarkable. <clears throat> Even if the anger that you feel against this person is greater than the anger that you feel against the person who you do, in fact, take some sort of retribution against. So what this implies is that anger can be redirected against targets that are closer, are easier to access, are more convenient. Um, it could be a matter of chance as well. And so there's only so much anger available, you could say, if we're following out this idea. And he, he brings up two examples, each of which helps us to see an important aspect or side of this dynamic. So the first one that he brings up is this guy, Philocrates. And this is a very interesting case, right? It shows us that if we can delay other people possibly getting angry with us over something until they've got a better target, then maybe we can keep them from getting angry with us. We can keep them in a calm state. So it says, uh, Philocrates, when somebody asked him why he did not justify himself, and it's, it's literally here in the Greek, ti uk, uk apologe, right? An apologe. It's interesting because that's the word that we get apology from, right? And in ancient Greek, apologen did not mean to say you're sorry and make amends. It meant to give a defense speech, typically within the courts. So, you know, for example, Plato's apology and Xenophon's apology are both Socrates justifying his own actions at his trial. So this isn't yet at a trial, 
And so this shows us that the scope for justifying yourself could be, you know, much more uh, extensive socially. And they're asking him, why don't you justify yourself? People are getting miffed with you, but, you know, you could say something to them. And he says something quite interesting. Instead of saying why, he says something about time. He says, not yet. Why not yet? Why not justify yourself right away so that you can get the matter dealt with? Well, he realizes that if he tries to justify himself right away, then he becomes a target. People are going to get angry with him. And so he says, I'll justify myself. I'll bring myself to people's attention when I see somebody else who is accused, and the word for that is dia uh, beblemon, right? And so it's, it's a, uh, you could say, accused, slandered, um, brought up as a bad person, right? And again, publicly, not necessarily in the, the law courts, but I'll, I'll do it when I see somebody else who is accused of what? Of the same thing. Um, hotan Alon idio. Idio is uh, idion, right? you know, uh, the same kind of matter. And so why would he do that? Because he realizes something that Aristotle's pointing out. If people see somebody else being accused of the same thing and their attention turns to that person and now they're angry at that person, I can bring up the fact that I did it after they discharged their anger onto that person and they won't be as angry with me, or perhaps they'll be completely calm. They'll be like, well, you know, you're right. It's, it's good that you, ju that you, you know, acknowledge the fact that you did this thing over here, but we've already taken care of matters over here. Now, is this rational? Not really, but Aristotle is noting something that does happen in human psychology. It's almost as if anger because it is, as he'll say in another place in the Nicomachean Ethics, a hasty servant, it wants to get its job done right away. He's got another interesting example as well, where it's more a matter of luck or chance. Um, ergo Philus, the Athenian people are angry with him. By the way, I should mention with Philo, Philocrates, the people, the demos, right, are the ones who are angry. So the Athenians are angrier with him than with Callisthenes. And so you could expect that Ergophilus is going to get a worse sentence, a worse treatment, right? And interestingly, the word that's being used for angry there is halepainontes, um, creating difficulty. Uh, being, you know, indignant is one way in which it's translated here. They're angry enough, however, or indignant enough to condemn Callisthenes to death. And so they do that the day before um, Erogophilus is coming up before them. And because they've already condemned him to death, Callisthenes, the previous day, they acquit Ergophilus. Why? Well, because um, they have, you know, as, as Aristotle is going to say, they've discharged their anger at another person. The Greek for that is eis alon teis orgain analososin. And this is quite interesting because we, could, we, we can use the word discharged with this metaphor like anger is something in a container and you pour it out onto somebody else, and now the anger is gone. But the Greek term there, analososin, is actually something along the lines of having like spent money, right? Having exhausted resources. So you've, you've gone through the anger that you're feeling, and because you've used up that anger, now you're in a state of calmness, even towards somebody who previously you were angry with 
or could get angry with, right? And so both of these examples are really quite apt because they show this dynamic that Aristotle is keen to bring to our attention that anger against uh, one person might in fact be appeased or lessened or calmed by discharging that anger at another person, even if you're angrier at the first person than you are at the second person. And we should remember that the rhetoric is primarily about how you can uh, arouse or calm or get rid of particular emotions so that you can attain certain results. And you know, we could think of this in very cynical ways. We could also think about this in ways that protect those who we care about. This is a very important dynamic to note.